Hello and welcome everyone to lecture 35 of this series on fluids and electrolytes. The series is based on my book manual of fluid electrolyte and acid-based disorders, a pathophysiologic approach to common clinical problems. I'm Dr. Mohamed Tinawi. I'm a nephrologist in Northwest Indiana. You can find my book on Amazon. Follow the link below. We are still on chapter 5, hypomagnesemia and hypermagnesemia. This is part 5 of hypomagnesemia. Let's talk about treatment of low magnesium. Like we said before, serum magnesium does not reflect total body magnesium because only 1% of total body magnesium is in the extracellular fluid. So patients with low normal magnesium are frequently given magnesium, especially if they have hypokalemia, hypocalcemia, or cardiac arrhythmias. Even if they're low normal magnesium 1.6, 1.7, we still give them magnesium. This will prevent complications. Now we should address the cause of hypomagnesemia. So if there's dietary deficiency, we should counsel the patient. If uh, the patient is on a thiazide diuretic or a loop diuretic, it's frequently very helpful to add, uh, to add amylurite or spironolactone because those are not just potassium sparing diuretics, but also they are magnesium sparing diuretics. So this way you don't have to supplement extra magnesium or potassium, or at least you can cut down on the supplementation. Now, if the patient cannot take oral magnesium salts, or if you are having severe complications, such as cardiac arrhythmias or seizures, you have to give intravenous magnesium. Now, we have many oral formulations of magnesium. Uh, we have capsules, we have tablets, some are available over the counter. Now, two formulations, magnesium citrate and magnesium hydroxide, are used as laxatives. Now, if you are giving some magnesium salt that you're not familiar with, or if the patient says that he's taking some magnesium salt, let them bring the bottle, read the bottle to find out exactly how much elemental magnesium there is, because it really varies from manufacturer to manufacturer. Now, unfortunately, we cannot give so much oral magnesium because of GI side effects, nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. Now, imagine someone who has low magnesium because of diarrhea. So you give them more magnesium so they get diarrhea now from the magnesium. So that is a limiting factor. By far, the magnesium salt that is used the most is magnesium oxide. Usually we prescribe 400 to 800 milligrams twice a day. Okay, 60% uh, of the weight of the tablet is elemental magnesium. So a 400 milligram capsule contains 240 milligrams of elemental magnesium. Bioavailability is very poor and you can use capsule, you can use tablets. Magnesium gluconate is available over the counter. Um, you have magnesium chloride also available over the counter. Same for magnesium lactate. I put this table and even this table cannot be always accurate because it depends on, your ma on the manufacturer. You really have to read what is on the bottle. If you want to save yourself some time, just remember magnesium oxide, 400 to 800 milligrams twice a day. That's it. Now, if the patient has persistent hypomagnesemia or if we have complications, we have to use intravenous magnesium. Here, um, you only have to remember one magnesium salt, magnesium sulfate, okay? Magnesium sulfate can be given intravenously or intramuscularly. If the patient cannot tolerate oral magnesium or if you have cardiac arrhythmia, you are going to go with an intravenous solution. Like we said, oral solutions have problems causing diarrhea. They're poorly bioavailable. So oftentimes you find yourself in the hospital given a lot of intravenous magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate is available as a 10% solution. We have 1 gram per 10 ml for intravenous use. This is really reminiscent of what? Of calcium gluconate. Now, intramuscular magnesium sulfate, in, in the United States we rarely use that, uh, it's available as a 50% solution. So here you have 1 gram in 2 ml. Mercifully, you, you don't want to give an injection, an IM injection of 10 ml. You only can give 2 mls. 
Now, one gram of mag sulfate contains 98.4 milligrams of elemental magnesium, or about eight milliequivalents, four millimoles of magnesium. Now, a typical dose in a stable patient is one to two grams over 30 to 60 minutes. You can use a higher dose over a long period of time if serum magnesium is very low. So if you get someone with a magnesium less than one, maybe you are going to use four to six grams over maybe uh, four to six hours. Now, we monitor serum magnesium. We repeat it after we replace until normal magnesemia is achieved. Now, if the patient has seizures or cardiac arrhythmias, we are give, going to give one to two grams quickly over 15 minutes. We're not going to drip it over 60 minutes. Then after that, we can keep giving magnesium sulfate, okay, uh, as one to two gram doses, or we can use a drip. A magnesium sulfate drip will be run at three to 20 milligram per minute. So let's give an example. Uh, we can put 10 gram of magnesium sulfate in a liter of 5% dextrose in water, and we can infuse that over 24 hours. This is going to give us about seven milligrams of max sulfate per minute. Now, once we have normal magnesium, we're going to stop. Now, this is useful if you have a hungry bone syndrome situation, if you have a refeeding uh, hypomagnesemia, rather than keep giving uh, magnesium sulfate one to two grams, you just uh, give 10 grams over 24 hours and be done with it. So this is appropriate for patients with severe ongoing hypomagnesemia. What about preeclampsia? Now, with preeclampsia, the drug of choice is magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate has been around maybe for over 50 years for this indication. And there's really nothing better. Phenytoin is not better. So the drug of choice to prevent seizures in women with preeclampsia is magnesium sulfate. Now, with preeclampsia, on purpose, we are going to use a really high dose of magnesium sulfate. There are many protocols. For example, you can use six grams intravenously over 50 to 20 minutes. This is really fast. I mean, we said normally we replace one to two grams over 15 to 30 minutes or over 30 to 60 minutes for that matter. Here we are giving six grams IV over 15 to 20 minutes, and then we are going to give a continuous infusion of one to two grams per hour. This is a crazy high amount of magnesium sulfate. So we are going to cause to induce hypermagnesemia to prevent seizures, okay? So the patient will have hypermagnesemia. This is the purpose of such a dose. Now, we don't have a target level, different publications, uh, quote, different things, but usually a target of 4.8 to 8.4 is appropriate, and I prefer a lower target. We really don't need to go to uh, 8 and cause magnesium toxicity. Now, again, this level of hypermagnesemia usually is very toxic if you have someone with, say, chronic kidney disease or acute kidney injury. But usually you are giving this magnesium to a healthy young woman, okay? So they are rarely, if ever, going to get severe toxicity from hypermagnesemia. Now, a lower magnesium level, like I said, maybe lower than 2 millimoles per liter or 4.8 milligram per deciliter, may be just as good for seizure prevention. So I think you don't need to go more than uh, 4 to 5 milligrams per deciliter. Now, if you have a patient with a rare condition, okay, you have myphenia gravis and preeclampsia, then magnesium sulfate is relatively, at least relatively contraindicated because magnesium is going to inhibit the release of acetylcholine. In that case, you probably have to use a lower magnesium dose. Maybe you have to use uh, uh, phenytoin. Um, now, uh, I have uh, an article on the subject of hypertension in pregnancy, and it talks in more uh, detail about preeclampsia, where it fits on the spectrum of hypertension in pregnancy, how to, how to evaluate it, how to treat it. I'm going to uh, provide the link below for those who are uh, interested. I'm going to end here and we're going to continue chapter five in the next lecture. See you then.